Welcome to Commander Central episode 115, and today we're going to talk about keeping your deck in check, which means ways to limit the power of the deck you're playing, assuming that's what you want to do. I'm Dana. I'm Max. And I'm Joe. Holy cow, welcome new cast member Joe. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. <laughs> <laughs> welcome back, Chris. It's been a while. It has. I am super psyched to be back. How's the new house treating you? Uh... Pretty good. I think I broke my toe this morning, though. <laughs> what did you, moving what? furniture or something? Well, we have this, like, one of those uh, ladder things to get into the attic in the garage. Okay. And it was down, and I went around the corner, like, moving fairly quickly and totally kicked it with my sandals on. Oh! And, and my pinky toe on my left foot is hurting right now. The perils of home ownership right there. Yeah. It was wonderful. This is also the first time you've had to commute to Max's house to record an episode versus just walking the uh, 50 yards. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. It was an annoying drive. <laughs> Dang, people yeah. don't know how to drive at this time of day. We usually record right after work on a Thursday, so you hit everyone coming home from work, even though I don't think you're going very far still. No. I think next time I'm just going to take the bypass here. Yeah. That'll probably be easier. Well, it's good to have you back, my friend. <laughs> Even though I'm not there physically, I'm recording from the road again from a hotel room. But glad to have you back on the show. Well, thank you. You guys got to play some games this week. Chris got to play a game with Max. Yeah. I didn't play any Magic. What are you talking about? <laughs> you just played some uh, Mogus. That's not Magic. <laughs> <laughs> he played Rakdos Control. Rakdos Control, which I came to find out that you guys have been tuning your decks actually higher than what I thought they should be at. <laughs> What are you talking That's about? That's what we're going to talk about today. So guess what? Mine's going to get tuned <laughs> even better now. I, I don't know what you're talking about, smacking someone for 36 with a Tuvasa and then having it countered and whatnot to not win the game. It was amusing watching everyone fight over my ensnaring bridge, though. Oh, I hate that card. <laughs> you, you put an ensnaring bridge in that deck? Yes, I did, because oh, a lot you, of times you in Rakdos, you have, like, next to no cards in hand, because sure. uh, a lot of the draw that you do is that uh, impulse draw or whatever it mm -hmm. is. So it's not technically in your hand, so it just turns things off. Oh, wow. You are a monster, Chris. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I have not seen that deck forever, but I think Max is still planning on bringing it to Vegas, right? Yeah. In case anyone likes you, you can make them not do that anymore? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's that or Brago, people. That's what you get stuck with. <laughs> so who wound up winning that game you guys played then? I did. I shouldn't did. have won that game, but... <laughs> nice. Won it via triggers. Yep. Upkeep triggers killed Matt to finish the game. Yep. They, Havoc, Havoc Festival and Moga. So that, that's awesome. Havoc Festival just ends things very, very quickly. You're definitely on a clock then. Well, um, I, of course, didn't get to play this week, so I have nothing interesting to add there. But if you want to share any cool experiences from games you played, how would you do that, gentlemen? So you can find us on Twitter at CMDR Central. You can find us by searching Facebook CMDR Central. You can find us on YouTube searching CMDR Central, and you can find us online at cmdrcentral.com. You can also head over to flipsidegaming.com and use promo code CMDR in all caps to get 10% off all orders, $10 or more. They did just release their pre-orders for the core 2020 singles, so head over there and grab your new legends or some new lands or whatnot. You can also find us on patreon.com by searching CMDR Central. Uh, if you are so inclined to support us financially, we would greatly appreciate that. It goes to buying us the camera for when we go to video, the new lighting, and most importantly, me getting some <laughs> pants. Uh, but we do have a plethora of new patrons to say we thank do. you to. So I'm going to screw up at least three of these names. One of them <laughs> you should not. I know that for a fact. Which one? The one that's a one, oh, one I, word. Oh, yeah, no, I'm not going to screw okay. that one up. <laughs> uh, so we want to say thanks to Glenn Runyon, Josh, Joshua Wade, Brian Silverman, Brian McHugh, Skylar Harris, Jacob Perelio, Kenneth Sishin, Ryan Flannery, Chris Snyder, Derek Ray, Amateus, I'm not even going to try to pronounce your last <laughs> name, I'm really sorry, um, Jake, and Mark Mailer. Okay, so I think you did pretty good there for the most part. Yeah. I think we won't get too many complaints. Nice this, job, this, nice job, Max. Thank you. This last name has all consonants, and a lot of them are <laughs> Y's, and I don't know how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> 
well, here's the thing. When you try to do it correctly, that then tends to be even worse when you like, try to put some out like, okay, I think this might be it. If I, I think you pronounce this as a soft Y, you know, and then you're like, nope, that's <laughs> yeah, way, way worse. Y. All right. Well, yes, thank you all for supporting us. We do really appreciate it. it, it it's a big deal and makes um, it possible to put this show on a couple times a week. A couple times a week gets us to events to meet everybody. Yeah, it's it's the the support we get from people has been amazing so far. Yeah. We also have some contests ongoing here, Max. Yeah, so our Twitter giveaway this month is the Lorwyn starter deck Kitkin Militia. We're giving that away, so just retweet that when you see it pop up once a week, and we'll tally up all the retweets, and someone will win this complete pre-con deck. Has been opened, but all the cards are there. Everything is intact, including the awesome... Um, cardboard box that comes in with like Bridget Kinsbale hero on it. Yep. And I think there's a foil planes in there too. I forget, but I think there is one. Oh, I have no idea. I might look and we'll, we'll brush that up next week. <laughs> well, so many of those Lorwyn lands are really sharp looking. So yeah. Uh, and then our Patreon drawing this month is the Teferi temporal Archmage commander deck donated to the show by listener, Michael Shea Woodward. Uh, and, it's a solid deck. It is a competitive deck, so it's not your basic pre-con. There's some good synergies in that deck. Yeah, for sure. So that was a, is a cool thing to win. Yeah, so we'll be giving that out to Patreon supporters at some point here uh, and before the end of the month, correct? Yeah, so as long as you support us by the end of June, we'll be tallying up uh, doing that drawing probably in the second week of July uh, after the, the, holiday, the 4th of July holiday. All right, excellent. And then our final thing is our, our Patreon stretch goal. Oh, yeah. When we, when we have 200 patron supporters for, and we hold that for about a month, we're going to do another live deck build with the uh, minimum $400 budget, and then one of our lucky patrons will win that deck. We have a whole ton of uh, new possible commanders to choose from between this core set and Modern Horizons, too, so I don't think that will be a problem. We have to do it with mis mismatched basics, too. <laughs> no. <laughs> yes. White border. White border I'm basics. I'm fine with white border, not mismatched, though. <laughs> I actually have a ton of, like, nearly pristine revised white border basics. Nice. So we can definitely use those if <laughs> There's you want There's the $400. <laughs> right, right, right. But no, we've got an impressive amount of commanders here, so that shouldn't be a problem brewing for it. I, this uh, will take a little. We're not going to like preview the core set stuff just yet. Um, but man, again, like they they've figured out how to do core sets. I think they're still missing one card. <laughs> Which what's that? Goblin lackey. Yeah, I saw someone fake one the other day, and they'd posted it, but it was a fake. Yeah, same with Tarmogoyf. If they're trying to pitch the Tarmogoyf, it's going to be in it, and I don't think it will. Man, I mean, yeah. it's probably fine for standard, I would say. But, yeah, I don't think they would do that. But still, like, I remember back in the days when, you know, you're getting M14 spoilers and you're like, yeah, you know, there's, like, five interesting cards or something. Origins kind of did it right, but definitely the last two years, they've just figured out how to make core sets pretty cool. Yeah, so. I think the big thing is, is because they can pull away now from so many supplemental sets. Right. And they can actually make new cards for those sets and jam in reprints into the core sets. Well, and like especially this year, they're not like in past years, they've been really afraid of printing multicolored cards because they thought that was too complex for whatever reason. Like that doesn't seem to be a concern this year. They're just like, oh, hey, we got colored artifacts. We don't care. Three color shards or three color wedges. That's fine. Like they're they're just not worried about the complexity. And I think that's makes for a way more interesting core set. Agreed. So. And there seems to be a lot of, like, I'm not sure if it's supposed to be self-contained or if it's hinting at a future thing, but, like, the, there's a ton of wolves and things like that that I'm, I feel like are maybe indicating things to come down the road, or maybe that's just the sub-theme of this. But there's a lot of weird, like, tribe synergies and stuff going on, too. So I'm looking forward to previewing this course set in a way that um, I don't think I ever have before because there's just a ton of really fantastic cards in it. Have they released the name of the next set yet? No. We do not know the name of the fall set, nor we do know what plane it's on. Mm. And I mean, that's two months I hope away. I something brand new. So I guess yeah, that's, I that's three months new. away, I guess. But I, I would think it would be because we had Dominaria into um, Ravnica, so we've had two like existing planes in a row, so I feel like we're probably due to go somewhere new. 
But I yep, mean, I'm, I'm assuming we'll find out soon enough. Yeah, I mean, they don't they tend to make that some sort of announcement at PAX West in late August? It could, but that yeah, seems but really wait, close to when the set's going to come out. I mean, though. we're going to start seeing spoilers, I would guess, first week in September-ish, because it comes yeah. out end of September-ish. So I would think we should know in the next couple weeks at least the name of the set and what plane it's on. So, yeah, I mean, we're getting close. But, but Commander spoilers <laughs> start up here in, like, four weeks. So... Ugh. It's it's the summer of magic that never ends apparently, and I guess I'm I guess. okay with that. It's it is tiring though. Like I mean, I have not still got my Modern Horizons cards in my decks yet, and I'm already trying to figure out cuts from this core set. I haven't even put hardly any Modern Horizons cards in my modern decks. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean seriously, it's. But yeah, they just need to space this stuff out a little bit better. I mean, I'm glad we have a ton of cool new things, but. It's been kind of a relentless last couple months. So time to buckle down and uh, get those spreadsheets out and figure out where these cards are going, I guess. Yeah, they should just change the commander set to, like, December when Christmas is. I liked, I liked right it. Right around our birthdays. That works, too. I liked it when it came out after Thanksgiving or around that time and, yeah. you know, a couple of years back. It gave you a little bit of a breather in the summer, and it gave people something to get for Christmas gifts. But... They seem to want it in August, so I mean it's gonna work out fine this year because we'll be in Vegas for when it's released. So I'm sure there'll be some like fun events and things going on. Anyway, Chris, you mentioned something earlier about the power level of decks getting out of control, or at least outracing the power level of your deck. Yeah, I thought we detuned our deck. <laughs> no, you're just a noob. Oh, <laughs> really? You want me to turn that back into how it used to be? Well, so that raises – so here's here's what kind of inspired this conversation before Chris even made that comment. We did a show um, – the show before this was a deck tech where we looked at a deck with a minus one, minus one counter theme. And I made the comment that it gets tricky to do a deck tech on a theme deck like that because, of course, your deck is better if you put in a – I think we use Grave Titan, for example, because Grave Titan's a great card. But – if you're building with a theme, you kind of don't want to suggest cards like that that disrupt the theme because then it ceases to be your theme deck. And, and it loses some synergy too. But like, so that's a, an interesting power thing there because there might be cards that make your deck better, but they don't work with the thing the person's trying to do. So that, as an observation, is a, is, is a thing about power that limits the suggestions you can make to tune a deck. The second thing is a thing that I've commented on before, also similarly with a deck tech, where every deck is better with a mana crypt and a mana vault. I mean, you can make arguments and talk about exceptions, but like for the most part, those pieces of fast mana make your deck better. And the same is true with Grim Monolith and, you know, Mox Diamond and um, Chrome Mox. And then at that point, you're looking at, you know, what's your soul ring? You're looking at, seven or eight or nine artifacts well you can probably then run mox opal at that point and like it chains once you've gotten all those things in your deck and your deck is running that fast with with the mana rocks well okay why are you running Talrand when you could just be running to fairy that makes the deck that much better too like at some point when you tune a deck unless you intentionally stop tuning your deck it's a cedh deck like, like, like that's the end point and if you're not getting that end point, then you're choosing to power your deck down. And clearly, we've chosen to not get to that level. So it, it raises Someone must question. not have sent the memo to Max. Right. Well, <laughs> and, and that's like, it's different if you're a scumbag, right? I think like yep. different rules apply if you're, you know, if yeah, you're yeah. a scumbag. Um, I wrote half of them. <laughs> right. <laughs> but if you're like a normal person with a soul, I think that it's a little bit different. So I, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of these power things here. And the first thing, and I kind of want to hear what you guys, how you define this, how do you define the power level of a deck? I Meaning, like, what makes, what is power in a deck? What makes a deck powerful or strong? And I'll ask Chris first. Uh, for me, it would be um, mana cost versus, like, the utility of the card. And we'll take, um, for instance, uh, we'll do Damnation versus, I guess, we'll throw out, like, Crux of Fate or something. Sure. There is only one difference in the CMC, but Damnation is a more powerful card because, in my opinion, at four mana, you can get it out faster, earlier, and it just saves you overall. 
I mean, like, unless you're playing some Rakdos Dragon deck, 99% of the time, Crux of Fate is a five-mana damnation. Yes. So, yes, that's that's definitely one that jumps out at me. How, how about you, Max? Um, you know, I think it has to do with just the uh, how synergistic is it with your deck. I mean, you can build a synergistic deck or thematic deck and have powerful cards. You know, Dana's... Like, Tuvas is a great example. Uh, an Enchantress deck that has a commander that draws when you play an enchantment. So really, any low-mana enchantment is powerful because it's a card draw engine. Right. I think... It, I was thinking with this all day today when I, was, when I was kind of in the back of my mind when I was working. And I thought about, okay, this thing is strong, but... Or this thing is strong, but... The one thing I kept coming back to was speed. For me, at least, when I think of how strong a deck is, it does come down to, to speed for me. For example, Pass to Exile or Source to Plowshares, I think are probably two of the most powerful cards that are in the format, period. I mean, one mana, instant speed, exile removal is amazing. But I never... I never worry about running those against somebody despite them being crazy powerful. Compared to something like Mana Vault and Mana Crypt, I feel like removing things or solving problems really quickly is a different... It's powerful, but it's not a power in a way that makes it difficult for people to play the game against you in the way that Mana Crypt and Mana Vault and Grim Monolith do. So for me, when I think of power, I think of speed, generally speaking, in terms of how fast you can get those things out and do those things. And to a lesser extent, the speed in which you can win a game with a combo. So like, you know, a five card combo doesn't ever seem particularly powerful, quote unquote, to me, versus like Thopter Foundry, sort of the meat combo, where it's fast and cheap and easy to get out and you can just win the game with it instantly if you top deck, you know, the pieces appropriately. So, for me at least, when I think of power and when I think of keeping the power in check, I think of the speed in which you can win a game, both in terms of racing ahead with your mana and actually just winning the game with as few cards as possible that are cheap and quick. Does that make sense? Totally. Yep. Now, that's me, though. Like, someone else might see other things in my deck and be like, yeah, that's super powerful, and I, I dismiss it because it's not doing a thing quickly, so... That's, I'm not saying I'm right. I'm just telling you guys what uh, how I look at it. Um, and I, I think that's tricky. I think that's one of the things I think we've all like played different decks and with different people where they like, oh, my deck isn't powerful, and it winds up being super powerful because they don't look at it that way. Or we've played people that are like, oh, yeah, here's my super strong deck, and then you're shocked at how 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 bad it is, at least based on how you judge power. Fair enough. So, so I, I do think it's kind of a sliding scale, but I, I, that's at least what I look at when I when I talk about power in a deck. So, do you guys actively try to keep the power of your decks in check? I used to, <laughs> not anymore. <laughs> tell, it tell seems you like everyone opened the doors, and now it's just like fair game. Well, we now welcomed you, you back with open arms. <laughs> <laughs> now you say that though, Chris, but like, I, here's what I think is going to happen. I think you are probably going to tune one or two of your decks a little bit. But I bet what you don't do is I bet you don't go add Mox Diamond and Grim Monolith and Krypton Vault and Opal. Trash cards. Trash right. cards. <laughs> but like, I bet you're going to add strong responses and strong answers and things. But I yes. bet you're not going to add that speed artifact ramp to, to, to race ahead of everybody. No. No, there's uh, no reason to do that. Especially in my deck since I play a lot of uh, the Rakdos Mardu type of decks. Those actually hurt me in the long run because sure. you don't have the card draw to refill your hand. You don't have, you know, the you may have acceleration with all these weenies, but you don't have these great big bombs that other colors do that can protect themselves. Right. Yeah. In 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 some of the decks, well, in 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 like a CEDH environment, for the most part, like the speed is something everyone's doing, so you need to do it to keep up, regardless of how your deck's trying to win. Generally speaking, whereas yeah, if you're not playing at that level. Some decks like your Mardu one, they, the speed doesn't matter. It's nearly yep. as much, at least. Pick when everyone else around you isn't doing that same thing. Exactly. How about you, Max? Do you try to keep the power in check, and what do you do to do it? Well, Scumbag. I, I try. Apparently, <laughs> I fail at it, according to Chris. Um, 
you know, I think it depends on the deck. A deck like Brago, where I do want to race out ahead, I play those fast mana rocks and the the, the cheap draw spells and whatnot. So it's a bad example, though, for fast mana because Brago blinks them, and that you're you're abusing the effects that way instead of actually true. You know, having to pay the four to untap yeah. my Grim Monolith or yeah. something. Right. Yeah, I would um, say even then, Max, that's, that's that's a good example though. You are running Grim Monolith, and you have a Krypton of Vault. I think you have them both in that deck, right? Uh, just Vault, just not Vault. Crypt yet. I own Crypt is in Dramoka. Okay, but you th- those are ones you like. Chris said you can abuse with the Blink ability. You aren't running something like Chrome Mox or Mox Diamond or Lotus Petal just to get that early burst to get ahead to like find that turn three or four combo either. You're running rocks that you can generate supreme value with because you can blink them, but it's not necessarily about the speed. Right. Um, where in like a slower deck like Jermoka, you know, Mana Crypt is literally just used to speed out ahead to drop my, my five or six drop creatures yeah, on turn three or four. Pretty, your yeah. CMC, your creatures are pretty high in that yeah. deck. So, and, and again, so I guess, you, you're also not running Lotus Petal or Chrome Mox or Mox Diamond or Opal or anything in that deck either. Like, you do have a couple fast mana rocks, but they're ones that make bulk mana to make that eight drop only cost four instead of trying to make that three drop cost one. Yeah. See, my speed comment. See, I'm, I'm, I might be onto something there with you two. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> So what, I might also just be a cheap person, and I don't want to <laughs> buy those really expensive <laughs> right. cards either. Well, no, that's well, that's a thing too. Well, so, that, so, that, so here's the question: What reasons are there to keep the power of your decks in check? And the first one that jumps out at me is because not everybody can afford to play at that level. Yes, and honestly, I like keeping decks in check because you have a more fun game, and people aren't salty afterwards. Granted, yes, you're going to just run into a player who's just salty. Period. You know. Yeah, well, and all that, but overall, if you're having a fun time, people aren't mad about it. Well, especially like you, Chris, who does play competitive formats, like it, when you want to just bust somebody in the chops, you have a way to do that when you're yep. playing to play play modern or something, and you don't feel bad about it because you're like, well, you're playing competitive modern. That's what it is. <laughs> like no one can be salty yeah. really then. Yeah, if you're gonna be salty, man, I think you just need to go home. You're right. playing the wrong <laughs> game, <laughs> right. right? For sure. No, that's yeah, that, that's that makes complete sense too. Well, especially like in, in using myself for an example, but I know this applies to a lot of people. If you work a job that's relatively stressful or something, and then you know we play right after work, so a lot of us come to the shop after work. I I just want to play a fun game and see fun things happen. I I don't want to have to like focus on every stack interaction and race out to get that win. And like I, I want it to be. I'm not saying that can't be fun. I'm just saying it's not the fun I want to have after. A, a stressful day at work, I, I want to do something that, that's like an unwinding thing versus something that to me seems just as stressful. Yeah, I mean, it's it's nice to have at least one CEDH deck. Sure. Because sometimes you're going to run into those guys who are like, you know, I want to play a fast game. I want to see, you know, infinite yeah. combos and all that stuff. You're like, okay, pull out that deck and we'll see what happens. Yeah, everyone's on the same page. That's a good time, too. Or, you, you know, it, it's like... I use my Edric deck sometimes too when there's that person that comes in and, and is pub stomping someone. And you want to have a deck where, like, I can just pub stomp you back. It's like that's useful. That's a useful thing to have too. So, what other, Max, how about you? Like, what reasons do you have to keep the power in check? Because even when you say you don't on your, you know, decks, you still do. Like, you, you, like, like I mentioned, there's a lot of cards that would make your Brago deck stronger that you don't run. So, why is that? Yeah, yeah. Because uh, I want to have my opponents have a fun game. Like, I know I've made comments in the last few episodes where Brago kind of wins by stalling the game out. But there's a difference between stalling the game out the way I do it with, like, Planeswalkers or just getting value off of Blinking comparing to, like, a Winter Orb Stasis Lock and Tangle Wire Brago where you lock everybody out and you just sit there dirtling for an hour and a half trying to find that extra combo piece. Brago has a reputation as a commander that's both very strong and very likely to lock out a game with a soft lock, but I, your Brago deck doesn't do that. There are times when it can be tricky to play against it, um, when you do have some pieces in play that can bounce stuff, but usually the, you win the game then. like if, When you're in a position to establish some kind of a lock, it just ends. Yeah, for sure. And, and some, you know, I, do, I like winning that way with that deck. I know it's not the most prideful way to win, but it's a way to win. Sure. So I mentioned the, the 
the dollar thing because we do have like in our meta there's a lot of college students and there's some high school students even that come through the play that i mean they can't afford to run a lot of those pricey mana rocks and do a lot of those things to play at that level to a degree um and just not everyone has that kind of job or the ability to buy those cards if you're new to magic like if even if you do have you know an okay income stream coming through that you can spend on fun things you just don't have the cards maybe either to play at that level. And I, I don't want to like exclude people from being able to play magic. That matters to me. That's one reason I kind of keep mine in check. We mentioned it's not really the kind of games I'm looking for. And it's not like, that's not, you know, I, I just want to see people do their thing and have a good time. And then I want them to lose to me, but like <laughs> I want them to have fun along the way. <laughs> but the one example I've used, I'm not sure if I've even mentioned it here before, but I know I've said it somewhere. Um, Bartle Runax is a terrible Jund giant from the original Legend set. He's a 6-5 for 6 mana, and he's 3 green, red, black for a giant. And basically he has Vigilance, and he can't be targeted by enchant creature spells. So that's ba a bad card. But I, Bartle Runax I like because it's a bad card, but it's not awful. And I feel like if you built a Bartle Runax giant tribal deck with, you know, 20 of the Jund giants that are available, and then you ran a good amount of, you know, the black and green and red draw spells, and you ran the appropriate amount of removal spells, and you ran some board wipes, and you ran some nice green ramp, and you put some overruns in there to win games, and you are a competent player. I like the idea of a meta where you can sit down with Bartle Runax Giant Tribal, and if you've built your deck smart and you are a reasonably intelligent player, you have a pretty good chance to win some games. And I think if you get to a certain power level, you can't play competitively and have a chance to win a game with, with a bad Bartle Runax deck. So I like the idea of a meta where even a terrible commander can be effective if someone builds builds smartly around it. That, to me, yeah. is something I like the idea of. So that's one of the reasons that always jumps out at me when I build a power deck. When I build a deck, as I think, could somebody who is smart build a Bartle Runax deck and have a chance to play against me? Because I, I just like that, that that idea. I like the idea of somebody coming in with a pre-con, like a basic out-of-the-box pre-con, because those are relatively weak. And I want them to at least feel like they had a chance. Maybe they're not going to win the game, but they're also not going to get turned three out either and feel like, I don't want to do this again. There's been a lot of times I've sat down with someone who's playing a pre-con and I actually get blown out. Right. Because I forget what's in the pre-con and I'm expecting other cards, so I'm waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. And then something okay. else comes out and I'm like, oh, that's not a big deal. And then later I'm like, oh, wait, no, that was a big deal. I should have killed that. <laughs> you also can tend to ignore those decks sometimes too until it's too late. Yes. At we The last game we played um, when I was at the shop a week ago, um, it was a five-player game, so that those tend to get weird, too. And Dr. Mike had his clue-slash-treasure tribal deck out, and he won the game the at the end. clues lead you to the treasure. Yeah, and he won the game at the end. And, oh, I, I, you'll appreciate this, though, Chris. Do you know how he won it? I want to know this. Michael Synth-Lattice into Vandal Blast. Mm, <laughs> I feel so good. <laughs> and it, but, it, it win. It was at like the two hour mark, so like no one was. Everyone's like, yeah, well, that just happened. <laughs> <laughs> he, I have converted him to be a scumbag. <laughs> I mean, listen, at the two hour mark, there's no such thing as a scum, scumbag play in a deck. <laughs> when, it, when things have in gone a five on player that long. game. Yeah, in a five player game, right, yeah. So, so, what are some good ways, some things you can do to your deck to keep the power in check? What do you guys do, for example? Um, so, like, if I recognize the deck I'm playing is probably a little more, it kind of outpowers what I'm playing against. The first, I don't necessarily make swaps to my deck on the spot because I don't carry extra cards with me to the shop. You know, sure. Commander doesn't do sideboards. You just pull punches. You know, it's one of those, I don't need to play Dramoka on turn four. I can sit back and wait for six turns and play something else. I want you to play Jermoka on turn four because I want to kill it. And then it comes in and I want to kill it again and be like, you're never casting this card again. Uh, tap for 14, Jermoka? Yep. <laughs> Marari's Wake, Jermoka. 
No. So, like, pulling punches is the easiest thing to do. Particularly if you're playing right. against somebody else with a lower power deck. Right. You know, read the battlefield. You know, like Chris said, you, you may forget what's in that precon, but it's still a precon. Sure. So, I'd rather get blown out by a precon and have that player come back next week with, hey, I made some changes, versus I pub stomp that precon player and they never come back. Well, how about when you're actually build, for me. when you're actually building the deck and putting it together? How about then? Oof, I really don't know. I think it's just a give or take. Like I try the cards I want to play, and then I find out that it's way too powerful. Sure, and yeah, because either... we had that conversation before where you've played something, and then like a week later, you're like, "Yeah, I'm pulling this out from my deck. It was just too much." Like I've heard yeah, you, it, you've told me that before. Yeah, it creates unfun games, uh, or it just it's. It's the only path to victory I take every time. Like, it's a on-rails type of deck then. Sure. So uh, it creates unfun experiences for my opponents. It creates repetitive gameplay for myself, which in some decks I'm okay with, but most I don't like doing that. I like to have multiple ways to win. I can't remember who told me this or what the commander with the deck was, but somebody made the comment to me recently that they pulled their tutors from whatever Super Friends deck they had because as long as they had the tutors available... It was really clear you go get doubling season unless doubling season was already in your hand. Then you go get chain veil unless chain veil was already in your hand. Then you go get, you know, I forget what the other one was, but he's like, so I had to pull the tutors because it was the same play every time I knew what I had to go get and I would just go get it and win. That's why you pull those cards and you leave the well, tutors. Sure. In. And, and I would be tempted to do that as well. Tutors serve the other purpose of being a toolbox, which is something I tend to like my tutors for. But, but, I, but I get the thought process there. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, if you're going to take a tutor out of your deck, Dana, you could just take Dejeru out and play a different <laughs> commander. I could. <laughs> hey, um, you know, I, I've thought about perhaps taking that, in the past at least, taking that deck apart just to do a different Super Friends deck, but I like that it's so janky, so. And you got more stuff in Core 2020. I do. They're always printing white, mono white planeswalkers, so they'll always be new toys for me. Uh how about you, Chris? Anything you do when you build to intentionally keep the power level in check to a degree? Aside from, um, my, I think, I would say the, the fast mana rocks thing we all do to a degree. I guess the biggest thing that I do, and if anyone else has noticed it, all my decks are on a theme. Like, my Mogus is a control AoE effect damage deck. Yep. Like, all the cards do damage to everybody at some point in time. Like, whether it's during their turn they have to take damage, or on my turn I deal damage to everyone. Um, so I try to stick to a theme when I do it so I don't like go overboard because you could go easily if you're playing you know let's say I'm playing five color Morphon I mean I could go easily into combo route right mm -hmm. or into good stuff but instead it would be stick to a theme with it because Morphon is a theme type of general right um yeah no that makes sense um we like I said we mentioned that with that minus one counter deck the other day but yeah that's definitely true with a lot of decks like if you're playing a green deck it's probably almost always better with a birds of paradise in it like just in terms of that's a fantastic turn one play. You're almost always better off running two or three or four mana dorks to accelerate whatever you're trying to do out. You're almost always better off with a Steve in your deck. Your black decks are almost always going to be slightly better with a Grave Titan or or at least blue definitely with a Consecrated Sphinx. White's always going to be better with a Sun Titan, almost always. So like at some point, if you're going to limit yourself to a theme, that does keep you from putting in those quote-unquote staple things in your deck for sure. The, the one I I like the theme thing, I tend to do that myself. I, I like to use rules in my deck. I'm not going to do this or I'm always going to do this. That is one thing that really helps me keep my power in check. Um, I'll mention a few of them. My Glissa deck, um, no creatures that don't have Death Touch or at least the pre-Death Touch wording on Death Touch. I also have no green land ramp in that deck. I'm not running like Nature's Lore or Cultivate or any of those things. So my ramp is all artifact based ramp. A lot of them are fetch lands, but it's still, and it interacts with the Glissa's ability, but still I, I have none of the green like sorcery speed or whatever ways to get uh, land in that deck. Uh, my Sigarda deck, I'm only running creatures that have the words aura or enchantment in the creature text field. I have no artifacts, and the only ramp in that deck is enchantment based. Um, my Vela deck, I'm limited only to artifact creatures, and the only planeswalkers I will run are Tezzeret. My Sphinx deck is Sphinx only. I have no, like, utility creatures or anything aside from Sphinxes in that deck. My Mina and Den deck is all creatures and walkers that interact with lands. 
My Crash deck is only creatures that have plus one counter in the rules text, and my Recce deck is no non-legendary creatures. So, you know, as good as Birds of Paradise would be or a Crater Hoof would be, I'm not running them because they're not legends. So that's one of the things I specifically do is when I build a deck, I, I started off immediately with, okay, what rules am I going to build around? And then I stick 100% to not breaking those rules. And that's one thing that keeps the power in check for me that I do. How about budget? Like, obviously there's there's some unintentional budget things like, hey, I don't have nine Mox Diamonds, so obviously I'm not running those. But do you guys ever build with a specific budget in mind? Like, I'm not going to go over $100 or something? I use the cards that I have. As I've said numerous sure, times yeah, when I build that's, the deck, I use what I have. That's actually a good one, too. Like, you, there, there are decks you don't, you don't just order cards. You're like, well, if I've got it, I've got it. If I don't, I don't. Yep. Okay. How about you, Max? Is that something you do in one way or the other not no not really <laughs> honestly like i, I really think don't if, either so don't it's not just you if i know the deck doesn't need a mana crypt i'm not gonna go out and buy a mana crypt like right. that's a card that you need to study and figure out if your deck needs it well at least you in know, terms of it's like it's hard not it's hard not to buy a shock if you need a shock land and those right. are always going to be 10 bucks come play modern with me mm. you'd have play sets upon play sets like i do i'm fine <laughs> I don't really try to stick to a budget unless it's one of those, like, I don't really want to spend $300 on this deck. So, like, uh, the example would be Tuvasa. I started with Commander's Quarter's $25 video on that from a year ago. When I bought that entire list minus the lands, it was 30 bucks. Right. And then the cards came in, and then I opened my binders and said, okay, these four cards are way better than the four cards I just ordered. Cool, I have them for maybe a budget deck in the future or whatever, you know, just to have. But it's better than digging through. I, I felt that process was better than putting everything out in my binder, then finding the stuff that I am missing, essentially. Right. Okay. Yeah, um, I think it's on the Commander Social podcast. Um, they've talked in the past about, what do they call it, a found deck, where like they only do the same thing, like they only build a deck using cards they have in stock. So like they'll get an idea and say, okay, I'm only using cards that are in this you know giant box or whatever it is. Yep. Um, I haven't done that, but I kind of like that idea. That's definitely going to keep your power in check. Because then, too, like, oh, hey, there's a Consecrated Sphinx here. You don't feel bad about running that because you're definitely going to be, like, you're going to have the power ratcheted down somewhere else for sure. Yeah, I, I know CCO has done a deck about deck like that, too. They call it a binder build, I think. So it's just okay. everything out of their own collections to the point where they don't even use, like, EDH rec or Scryfall. They just start digging and throw 100 cards together. Sure. And, you know, to a degree, like, I think when we built the, the live show deck, there's an element of that. We weren't limiting ourselves necessarily, but we were also limited to what cards we thought of in a 40-minute window. Like, that, yep. that is also, to a degree, putting a, a, a speed bump on what the deck's going to do. Yeah. Um, I, I'll mention this one last because it's, uh, it's been discussed ad nauseum out there and you can find way better sources to talk about it than than us right now but jason alt has been a proponent for a lot of years of what he calls 75 percent deck building which is keeping your power in check and, and really a lot of the things we're discussing are kind of ways to build 75 percent where you just there's some way shape or form your deck isn't 100 percent tuned um, and he doesn't like it doesn't necessarily mean you build bad it's just like there's something that you're not taking all the way as far as you could take it, whether it's fast mana rocks or perfect removal or whatever. So I think if you want to read about that, there's a lot of discussions from Jason and other people you can find talking about his 75% ethos out there as well. But that's <laughs> speaking of Commander Social, Zach made a comment on the last show about his 75% uh, method where he builds 100% but plays at 50 <laughs> <laughs> which i thought was pretty great I'm not sure that's what jason means but i but i like his thinking so is it difficult for you guys to keep your power in check with your decks like when playing yeah, um when building is that something that you find yourself having to remind yourself or like do you get to that point with the deck where where you have to ratchet it back because we've had we've mentioned this you know three sets come out in the last three months but Two of those sets are, I would say, where the Spark and Modern Horizons have, at least for me, thrown more powerful Commander cards my direction than any back-to-back -back sets I've ever seen. Maybe back in the Urza block, I guess. I wasn't playing then, but, like, 
we've got two insanely powerful sets back to back in the last two months. Even if you only put one card from those sets in your decks, how much better have they gotten? And if you do that every single set, your decks are just getting more powerful naturally. And same thing, if you tweak your deck, you know, once a week, once a month, whatever, presumably those changes are making your decks more powerful to a degree too. So is that something that you have to keep an eye on or that you intentionally try to keep an eye on? Nope. No. I'm extremely lazy, so I won't, like, hunt down the cards. I'm like, oh, that'd be a cool card. And I'm just like, oh, I haven't cracked one out of a pack yet. Oh, <laughs> Yeah. Or okay, you go, well, hey, well, Max, do you have this? <laughs> uh, no, I I don't consciously keep in check that when I'm building that, oh, this might be too powerful because then I really don't learn that until you start playing it because it might sure. be too powerful against that pre-con, but playing against some of our more tuned decks, it's not too powerful. So it's really, it's too, there's too many variables to look at it on your, your deck stats or your architect, or even when gold fishing, right. you know, the hard copy at your desk going, oh, this card is good, but how is that going to interact with three to five other decks in your pod right. that you're playing against? In, in my case, I think because I tend to build with rules, that helps a little bit. Okay, I got a new, you know, death touch creature for Glissa that's gonna replace another one, but like, yes, that's making my deck better whenever I do that, theoretically, but there's still kind of a cap in place that prevents it from being a problem. Okay, I'm gonna run the new that new Sphinx that got spoiled from the core set and I'll replace another Sphinx, but it's still a Sphinx tribal deck. I still am limited in how strong it's gonna get. So I think the way I build my decks with rules in place that does help keep some of that power in check that said i guarantee i've played with people who don't think my decks have power kept in check at all they're like oh those that guy plays super strong decks i mean i'm sure i guarantee you that has happened even in our shop so like i said just because you think you're keeping your power in check and i i think i do to a degree i i'm sure not everyone agrees and i think one thing that i tend to do is i I do tweak my decks pretty regularly, and I also don't necessarily shy away from running strong cards. I just tend to not always run them in powerful, you know, in obviously powerful decks. But like, I've got a Yogmas Will in my Glissa deck, and that's a crazy strong card. I'm you know running. I'm trying to think of other examples along those lines. But like, I, I well my Sphinx deck, my Sphinx deck has a Crypt and a Vault in it. It doesn't have any of the other fast mana, but like every one of my Sphinxes costs seven mana <laughs> on average or something. <laughs> so like I run them because I need the mana boost to even play at the speed anyone else is playing at. But again, those are the only two I'm running at similar to your Dramoka deck max. I'm not running every piece of fast mana. I'm just running those two that give me, you know, three mana at a time so I can kind of play like I'm not running all seven drops. Yeah. But again, I'm sure there's plenty of people that I've sat down with that are, are like, oh, that... That Sphinx deck is is busted just because I do get that crypt out early, and I that has definitely happened, I'm sure. So, any final thoughts here, guys, on the power level thing you wanna you wanna throw out before we start to wrap up here? The best thing I can say about power level is if you want to detune your deck to try to bring it down power level, we'll use an example of Vindicate, D Spark, and Anguish I'm Making. Sure. If you want to take it down you take the worst of those three cards and put it in your deck yeah because they all do very similar yeah they all do very similar things but which one's the worst one out of them well then that's going to depend on how your meta plays yep like um in my opinion vindicates probably the weakest of them all because of sorcery speed even though it can hit anything yeah how about you max um you know power level kind of goes arm in arm hand in hand with the arms race that you might find in your meta where you start tuning your deck so other people start tuning their decks. I've never seen the reverse. I down-tuned my deck. Everybody else did. No, they, they keep their deck how it is. So, you know, it kind of is all about your meta. Like, yep. is it worth c- making that swap to something like Vindicate? Is it going to really detune my deck, yet still make me able to compete with the decks that aren't being detuned? So it's 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 a very fragile subject power level because it's all meta dependent and yes. every meta is different. And when I, and I would say in ours, I think for the most part everyone is to a degree on the same page in terms of power. People don't shy away from running that powerful card. People aren't afraid to run intuition or 
uh, Yogg Must Will or even like Gaia's Cradle or something. Like I see those cards, but they do tend to shy away from running the fast, explosive mana rocks for the most mm-hmm. part. And that is much more, that's something you can deal with, I think, in a way without having to, like the best way to deal with a guy's cradle is to put a couple more um, land destruction lands in your deck. Like the best way to deal with intuition is maybe run some graveyard hate. The best way to deal with the Yogg same with the Yogg will. Like those are things you can deal with by, by adapting your deck with some answers, whereas it's much tougher to deal with somebody who powers out their fast combo on turn three using that fast mana. So I think that is one thing about our meta, at least. Yeah, I, I would say it's a powerful meta in terms of people running powerful cards and interactions and decks, but it's not necessarily about the speed. And I think when things get slowed down a little bit, because I would say games don't end in our shop before turn 10 very often. Yeah, pretty rarely. And I think that it makes a huge difference if you are somebody who's not running expensive cards or not running huge powerful cards. You can find those synergies to let you compete when things get slowed down a little bit like that. Um, so that's, that's, that's for me, I would say the one thing is, is it's speed kills. And if you, can, if you are looking for a way to slow <laughs> it, does, man. And like in Magic, it does. That's, that's what does it. And if you want to like keep your decks in check, that, that's the thing I control most, and I, that seems to make the difference, for me at least. All right, guys, that is it. That will wrap up show 115. Thanks for editor Ken Peddle. You can find him on Twitter at LOAD3R. Our podcast theme is Retro Future Dirty by Kevin McLeod. You can find me on Twitter at Dana Roach. You can find Max at CMDR Central underscore Max. And you can find Chris at Squishy one We'll be back next Thursday with a deck tech. Until then, I'm Dana. I'm Max. And I'm Chris. And we're out of here.